Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our service tonight. My name is Josh. I'm the youth and schools worker here at Bethel Church. And if you're new to us and just joining on, you are more than welcome. We're now going to kick off straight away by singing, and we're going to sing a great hymn that I love the words of. It says, what a friend we have in Jesus, and it encourages us to take all situations to God in prayer. Let's sing together. to carry everything. 
everything to God in prayer. Fantastic. Well, we're now going to have a short video from Caring for Life. And these have been partners of us for a long time. And it's so good to hear some of the work that they're doing, which is quite similar to some of the stuff we've been doing recently in our local area as well. Well, hello, everybody. It's uh, good to be with you once again. And we bring you the love and the greetings of everybody at Caring for Life. And we pray you're keeping safe and keeping well. I hope and pray that what I say to you today will be an encouragement to you. And I hope it will encourage more prayer too. But we do want to thank you for your partnership and your prayerfulness for us here at Caring for Life. The Lord really is answering your prayers and hearing your prayers. Of course, we've just had Christmas and that was a different type of Christmas for us, as it was for us all. Of course, the message was the same, the hope is the same, but it was very different for us. We had uh, Christmas meals on wheels. We were taking out presents to those in our care and uh, that was ever so well received. We were able to visit an awful lot of people on Christmas Day. And then in the afternoon, we had our uh, Zoom parties, our Christmas parties, and that was chaotic to say the least, but it was great. And we thank the Lord for the opportunity to be able to do that. Of course, since Christmas, we've got back to business again and it's been incredibly busy with all sorts of things. Of course, we have our normal weekly activities that go on. So we've been on the phone every single day, all of our team, uh, both those on the core team and those on the farm. We've been making socially distanced visits to people when needed. We've been taking out our food hampers. Um, we've been having all of our usual regular stuff. Um, but even in the midst of what's going on now, we still have to move sometimes people from one property to the next. And we know that some people live in terrible situations here in the city. And we're currently moving two or three people at this minute in time. We've seen as the uh, benefits offices have opened again, um, more people needing our support to help them through tribunals. Um, and that can be very traumatic for the people in our care. So please pray for our benefits team as they help those folks um, pass through those uh, procedures, through those uh, tribunals. and pray that they really know peace and pray that the right outcome is found at the end of the day. We're supporting people, as you know, from all sorts of walks uh, and all sorts of backgrounds with all sorts of issues. Uh, and one thing that we have seen over this time, uh, especially from this third lockdown, is a deterioration in people's mental health. And that's a great concern for us as people can become more isolated. So we really need to be praying for those guys and we need to do here at Caring for Life all we can to engage with them and to encourage them. So we do value your prayers for those who at this minute in time are really struggling with their mental health. Another issue is uh, social vulnerability. We've got a number of people in our care who are uh, at this minute in time uh, fleeing domestic abuse and one young lady in our care we're currently moving house to flee from um, that kind of abuse in fact the partner that she was with is currently being sentenced for actual bodily harm so these are serious issues and uh, they cause us great concern but of course huge concern for those precious people who, who are having to go through these these things themselves but you know there are so many good things to talk about even in the middle of so much pain and suffering. I mean, it is literally a war zone that we work in here, but there is so much good to thank the Lord for. We thank the Lord for continued spiritual growth. As you know, we're here to share the love of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus. And we're seeing people come to faith and we're seeing spiritual growth. One conversation just the other week had uh, one gentleman say, can anybody re be religious? And it's great that we're getting opportunities and people asking questions. Well, we want him to know that we're not religious, but we're in a relationship. We're in a relationship with a loving Heavenly Father who sent his son. That's what we want him to know. So that's what we're about. But we thank the Lord for spiritual growth. We thank the Lord that we've been able to reach out to new people. And we've got an awful lot of new people coming to us at Caring for Life at this minute in time. One of those new referrals that we've only been supporting for a few months um, received a birthday gift from us. And she said to our worker that this had been the first birthday gift she'd received for 14 years. Isn't that sad? But isn't it sad that she even knows how many years it was since she last received a birthday gift? 
Uh, we pray that that won't be the last birthday gift she receives from us and maybe other people who become important to her in her life too. She comes, as she becomes part of this Caring for Life family. That's what we hope and pray uh, for her. But you know, picking up on those small things is actually a really big thing. It's, an, it's a crucial thing to pick up on those small things. And we want people to know that as we pick up on those small things, we want them to know that there's a God who cares about those small things too. Because that's the wonderful thing about our God, isn't it? That he doesn't just care about the huge things of life, the issues of salvation and sin, but he cares about the minutia of our lives too. And we want to pick up on those little things. And that will give us a doorway into be able to speak, into, into, into be able to uh, point people to the God who cares about the big things of life too. So that's what we really pray, earnestly pray. I know many of you are going through tough times, as we all are in this country, and we're praying for an end of this pandemic. But let me just give you this verse, and it's a wonderful verse, that we find in 1 Peter 5, and it's from verse 10 and verse 11, and it reads this, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. And we pray that for you, just as we pray it for those in our care, that after this suffering, you will become strong and firm and steadfast in the Lord's love, and you will know his presence in a very special and a powerful way. Thank you again for having us with you today. We pray God will bless you. And remember, we want to pray for you as you pray for us. So let us know what we can pray uh, in relation to the things you're going through. And listen, remember this, if you want us to come and join you via Zoom or God willing in the future in person, then we're ready and we're willing to come and encourage you with what the Lord is doing here at Caring for Life. So may God bless you and keep you. Fantastic. Well, let's pray for the work of caring for life. Lord, we worship you and we praise you. We thank you that you are the God of all creation. Lord, you're not just the God of Liverpool and of our church, but you're the God of the whole world. We thank you that you see the needs of those around us. And Lord, you mobilize us, your followers, your children, to, to reach out to those who are lost, who are desperate, who face injustice, who are hungry, who are naked, who are homeless. Lord, we pray for the work of caring for life. We thank you for the heart that you've placed within us to love other people. And Lord, we ask that as they seek to do that work in that area, Father, would your gospel speak loud and clear to those people. Father, would Christ be seen through the volunteers and the workers at Caring for Life. Father, would people receive far more than a food parcel or a friendly face or, or a smile. Father, would they see you at work in the midst of their lives. And would you turn hearts to you, Lord? Lord, would you bless the work of Caring for Life and um, for the whole team there? Lord, we know it's been particularly difficult over this pandemic uh, season as well. Father, would you strengthen them? Would you bless them? Lord, would you encourage them? Just as Nehemiah said, would the joy of the Lord be their strength as well? And Father, we think of our own area. And we think of the food parcels that went out to families and, and our friends in our area and through our schools as well. And Father, we pray for those families who are struggling today. Lord, again, mobilize us to reach those people. Lord, show us who they are. Help us to be able to deliver food, to be able to deliver friendship, but Lord, also to be able to deliver hope as well. Father, as we have our reading now, we ask that you'll speak through the words there. Lord, would you speak to each of us tonight? Would you still our hearts before you? Lord, would you and you alone be the one who speaks uh, this evening as we read your word? But Lord, would you change us upon hearing it as well? Father, we ask this for your glory and your glory alone. Lord, build your kingdom this evening, we ask. For we ask this in your name. 
Amen. Well, we are going to have our reading now, and it's uh, Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 to 20. Our reading is taken from Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 to 20. That night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children would be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of that land, because we will swallow them up. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting, To all the Israelites, the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me, in spite of all the miraculous signs I have performed among them? I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. Moses said to the the Lord, Then the Egyptians will hear about it. By your power you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of this, of this land about it. They have already heard about you, O Lord, that you, O Lord, are with these people, and that you, O Lord, have been seen face to face, that your cloud stays over them, and that you go before them in a, cloud, in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. If you put these people to death at all at one time, The nations who have heard this report about you will say, The Lord is not able to bring these people into the land he promised them on oath. So he slaughtered them in the desert. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed, just as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generations in accordance with your great love. Forgive the sins of these people, just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. The Lord replied, I have forgiven them, just as you asked. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. Before we open that passage together, we're going to sing again. And we're going to sing a song called, I Stand Amazed in the Presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And one of the verses, it says, For me, it was in the garden when he prayed, not my will, but yours. And it talks about Jesus' anguish before he headed towards the cross. And I'd love for us tonight that as we sing those words, to really let that truth sink into us, that he went to the cross for each and every one of us. It was sacrificial, it was costly, it was painful, and he did it because he loved each and every one of us. Let's sing as we do indeed stand amazed in his presence.
Well, it is my privilege to be bringing you God's word tonight. And can I just say, I, I love this passage. I've been reading it this week and I came across it and I thought this is something I'd love to share with you because I just think it is so powerful. This is an interesting passage and it's striking for its undeserved forgiveness that is found within these pages. I know for myself, as I've been watching our services at home, so easy it is to just sit on the couch and think, well, the verses are going to come at the bottom, so I don't really need to open my Bible. But can I encourage you not to do that? Have your Bible open and follow it with me as well. I'd love for you to have your nose in the text and to see the riches that are found here. So have your Bible open at Numbers chapter 14. And if I was to give you a banner or a title for tonight, it would be this, trust in God. I'm going to split it into three sections. First of all, don't push God out, verses 1 and 2. Uh, secondly, uh, don't go back to slavery, verses 3 to 10. And then thirdly, we need saving, verses 11 through to 20. Have your Bible open and let's dive in. As we reach chapter 14, it's important to know what's come before this. As we open Exodus, uh, at the very beginning of Exodus, we read that the Israelites, otherwise known as Hebrews, are now in slavery. They're crying out to God from Egypt. You see, they've been enslaved by an Egyptian king who was afraid that they might revolt against him. They were enduring forced, hard labor. Beatings were commonplace, and we know that from later on and what happens with Moses. Freedom has vanished. No happiness, no peace, and no hope. But worse than that, there's been a baby boy genocide. Death and oppression surrounded the Israelites in Egypt. It was a sorry place. It was a place of absolute turmoil. Please remember that as we go through our passage this evening. And through that death and oppression, God calls a runaway prince that should never have been royalty in the first place. A man called Moses. He was a Hebrew or an Israelite. He escaped this genocide of, of the young boys who were meant to be thrown and drowned in the Nile. And he ended up being adopted by the princess of Egypt. As he grew, he grew up to live in the royal house until one day he saw a slave driver beating one of his fellow Hebrews. He attacked him, he killed him, and then he went on the run. Moses was 40 when that happened, and another 40 years go by with the people still crying out to God. And then, at the age of 80, God calls Moses to demand the Pharaoh release his thousands and hundreds of thousands of free slave labor. <laughs> the mountain seemed immovable, didn't it? Why would Pharaoh ever let them go? But Moses eventually went. And after 10 mighty acts of God, the 10 plagues of Egypt, Pharaoh finally released the people. The mountain had been moved. As they approached the Red Sea, Pharaoh changed his mind and sent his army after the people so that as the Israelites came to the Red Sea in front of them, the enemy was breathing down their necks behind them. They were stuck. How would they escape? The mountain seemed immovable, but then God moved the sea. He caused the waves to part and the Israelites walked on dry ground across the Red Sea and as the Egyptians followed behind, the waters closed in and they drowned. The mountain had been moved. In the desert, they were led by God as he provided fire to follow by night and a cloud by day, a visual sign to them of the presence of God with them. How amazing is that? But then they realized there was no water. Like I say, hundreds of thousands, if not a million Israelites, men, women, and children, and some others who decided to go with them as well, now had nothing to drink. The mountain seemed immovable. 
But then God brought water out of the mountain. He caused the rocks to spill forth water. God had done the impossible once again. And then there was nothing to eat. And yet the mountain seemed immovable in that situation as well. And yet God provides manna from heaven to feed them. I hope you can see a theme here of God's mighty acts. You see, again and again, God moves the mountains. The impossible is done. God shows that he is the one in control. Yet what is their response? Well, as we read through Exodus and part of Leviticus and, and Numbers as well, we, we, so we come to this point, we realize that these Israelite people again and again rebel and grumble against God. God has proven himself. God has proved that he is the God of the impossible, that nothing is too big or too great for him. He can do anything. Surely the Israelites should have trusted every word and gone with a leap in their step forwards. Yet what we actually see is that again and again they say, I don't trust you, God. This is too big for us. We'd we'd be better elsewhere. Try not to give it away here. You see, as we read through these accounts, we're left feeling probably a lot like Moses did in his frustration. As these people continually to choose uh, choose to do what is not right. Did you know that at this point, only around five months had gone by? (laughs) That is a lot of disobedience within five months, isn't it? That is a lot of God showing his power and yet the Israelites just refusing to trust in him. In such a short space of time. And so... After around five months since leaving Egypt, known as the Exodus, 12 spies were sent to spy out the promised land, Canaan. These spies, they traveled for um, around 40 days. They did 250 miles all the way up north from the south. They went right through Canaan. They spied out the whole land and then they turned around and they traveled back again. And then they brought their report. For two of those 12 spies, Caleb and and Joshua, they said, and I'm paraphrasing here, you can read it for yourself in chapter 13, let's go. Let's go right now. (laughs) We can overcome the land. (laughs) They, They didn't see any barriers in their way. And the reason they didn't, and we can see this here in the passage, is because they said, God is with us. There's no need to wait. It's it's ours for the taking. Let's go. God can do this. They were chomping at the bit. But the other 10, they saw the same land and they'd seen the same amazing acts that God had done. Yet they were afraid. You see, they saw the mountain here of taking the promised land and they decided that this mountain couldn't be moved. It was too big for God. They brought a bad report. You can see that in chapter 13, verse 32. They, they were almost as if they make it sound worse than what it is. And they told the people of the Nephilim, these, these giants who lived in the area, and, and they said that the, we look like grasshoppers, like, like bugs in their eyes. We're just going to be crushed. We don't stand a chance. And so, after hearing the reports, it's now decision time for the Israelites and this is where we pick up the account chapter 14 that's just the recap and the introduction so here's what I want you to know don't push God out that's the first thing don't push God out you see we read in verse 1 then all the congregation raised a loud cry and the people wept that night we have to ask why are they acting like this Why haven't they just jumped straight in with Caleb and Joshua? They haven't seen what God has done over the last few months. Of course they have. They've seen all of his mighty acts. They've seen all of his power. Surely they should be um, just full of trust in God and should just be jumping straight in. But also notice here what isn't included in the text. What hasn't happened You see, it should read something like this. 
that the people heard the reports and they consulted God. But that's absent here because it didn't happen. The Israelites, they heard the reports and they just decided to make their decision without including God. See, notice that it doesn't say that they listen to the reports and then consult God because God has already been pushed out. The people see the problem in their own strength and they rightly realize that this can't be done. I say that carefully and maybe you're thinking, hang on a minute, Josh, I I think you might have got that wrong. But the thing is, is that they're not meant to be doing this in their own strength. So as they looked at it and said, we can't do this, they were right. And that should have led them to trust in God. But they didn't. You see, they declined God and they uh, revolted against God. Their hearts grew cold towards God and they said that this mountain cannot be moved. You see, this was a land that God had promised them. This was a land that if you go back to Genesis, God had promised Abraham. It's a land that they would have grown up being taught about. And the promises that God had gave Abraham to say that his descendants were going to live in this land, they all would have known that. And as they stand right on the border, their hearts fail. And they refuse to trust God in this situation. And then their weeping turns to grumbling. Verse 2. And the grumbling, do you notice, it's actually directed at Moses and Aaron. Uh, They start to, to grumble against them. But just listen to the words that they say as well, because we'll pick up on that as well. I really feel for Moses and Aaron here. I can imagine that sense of optimism and excitement here in Caleb and Joshua's report. And maybe they were standing there thinking, yeah, come on, the Israelites, they're going to listen. They're going to trust in God. We're going to go into the promised land. We're going to take it. But then we can almost see it draining from their faces as the Israelites grumble at Moses and Aaron. It's a bit like a football fan, and I have no experience of this, I've got to admit, but a football fan who realizes that the goal was actually offside. The excitement turns to despair. Only a hundred times more intense here. The people have turned from trusting in God again. What a mess. You know, let's pause there for a second. Because the Israelites here, they're facing a scary situation going into the promised land. And we know the decision that they've made, but how about us? You know, we're all called to scary situations in our lives. Situations that are beyond us. I sat and I was thinking of some of the situations that I've found myself in. For example, being a parent, being a father. You know, I've always looked at the fathers around me and thought that they were heroes and they've got it all together. And now I've got to be one of them and I just don't feel like I can do this job. Or maybe the jobs that I've been called to, and I'll share a little bit about that in a while. But you know, the jobs and the tasks that we're called to, and we just feel a bit way out of our depth. God, I, I can't do this. Or maybe it's just situations in our lives, things that we face, difficulties, or, or maybe caring for loved ones, or, or, or maybe just a situation or a, a season that we're going through in our life when we just feel like the mountain is just too big. How about even in our call for evangelism, Christians? As we hear that call to share our faith and we just think, whoa, this is scary and I just don't feel like I can do it. Can I ask you, are you willing to turn to God and trust him in those situations? You you hear this phrase quite a lot. God will never give you more than you can handle. (laughs) I think that's a half truth, really. I know that for many people, they've kind of taken the words from 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, which says this, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And they've taken that idea and and they've placed it on a situation and they've said, God will never give you anything you can't handle. But what they regret to 
or forget to, to include there is that in those verses it says that God will bring you a way of escape when you're tempted. You see, we must rely on God's strength. If we just take that idea of we will never be given more than we can handle, then what we hear in ourselves is that I can do this. (laughs) I've got this covered. God, I, I don't need you. I can get through this by myself. That's just not true. It's not true. We need God for everything. Even the very air that we're breathing right now, we couldn't do that if it wasn't for God. Who created our lungs? Who causes them to function? Who gives us the very air to breathe? Of course, it's God. We need God for everything. As Jesus prayed in the Lord's Prayer, he said, give us today our daily bread. Lord, we need you for everything. And you know, it's quite often in those difficult times that God brings us to our knees to realize that truth as well. You know, it's those times when we face those huge mountains that God speaks to us and he says, you can't do this, Josh. Not on your own strength, but I'm with you. You know, before I I did this role, I was a teacher and I taught for, for four years And I went straight from university into teaching. And in university, I'd done well. I'd even had like commendations off lecturers, which I know is a shock to you if you know me, because it was definitely a shock to me. But I thought, yeah, I can do this. It's all good. I've got this. And then I went into my first teaching job. And I had my eyes wide opened on, on that job. And there was moments when I was told that you can't do this, Josh. You're not good enough. We need, to, we need to tweak you. We need to change you. Those things, they failed and they shouldn't have failed. And, and I remember many times, and I'll be honest with you, times when in tears, I said, God, I can't do this. For the first few months of that job, I, I said, God, I, let me do anything. Like I'll, I'll clean toilets with toothbrushes. I'll do any job other than this teaching job. That's what I felt, felt like. I just felt like it was just too big and I'd want, wanted to go anywhere else. Maybe you've been in the same boat. But then God spoke to me. This is my testimony. I, I know this to be true because God said, Josh, you can't do this on your, by yourself. But you're not alone. I'm with you. And for the two years following that moment, for the 14 minute journey it took me to get to school, my prayer every single morning was, God, I need you. I'm teaching maths today. God, I need you. I've got an observation today. God, I can't do this by myself. I need you. Lord, uh, there's, there's children in my class and they're going through these situations and they're just too big for me. I need you. I relied on God wholeheartedly because I knew that I was way beyond myself and the mountain could only be moved if God was in it. You know, as you go through these difficult times, it actually sounds quite crazy that sometimes you long for them once they're over because the lessons that God teaches you, the reliance on his presence that is just so tangible to you is like honey knowing that God is right there. So, don't push God out. Number two, don't go back to slavery. Sadly, the Israelites aren't finished yet. They've started grumbling, but not only do they want to um, uh, not want to go into the promised land, but they decide that they'd be better off in slavery. What? This is ridiculous, isn't it? It's absolutely crazy. They proceed to plan on on choosing a new leader to surpass Moses and to take them back to Egypt. That's right, the place where they were killing their sons, the place where they were forcing them to work, the place where they endured beatings daily. They wanted to go back to that place. This is just crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And they make this change from wanting to follow a liberation leader to wanting someone that will lead them back into those chains. And the response from Moses and Aaron says it all. Look at verse 5. 
It says they fall on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the people of Israel. Now be careful as you read this because this isn't submission to the people of Israel. This isn't submission or backtracking by Moses and Aaron to kind of say, oh, okay, uh, I think we've got this wrong. Uh, you know, don't, don't take us um, out of your leadership or anything like that. No. This is Moses and Aaron falling on their faces for God. Complete submission. An acknowledgement that if we sin against God, we have no defense we are worthy of wrath. This should have been enough to stop the rebellion. This should have been like pouring ice cold water on somebody to shock them into their tracks. As they see Moses and Aaron fall on their faces, they should have been saying, hang on a minute, what, what are we saying? This is crazy. But it wasn't enough. They continue and, and Joshua and Caleb, they even tear their clothes. Now this is done rightly here as opposed to other times when clothes, clothes are torn. For example, in Matthew chapter 26 verse 65, when the high priest, he tears his clothes at the words of Jesus, when Jesus says that he is the son of God. Joshua and Caleb, they tear their clothes in the right way here. You see, tearing of the clothes is a sign of grief. It's a sign of remorse. It's a sign of loss. David did it when Saul and Jonathan died in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. Elisha did it when Elijah was taken up to heaven in 2 Kings 2, verses 11 and 12. Job did it when he was bereft of all of his possessions, including his children, in Job 1.20. Mordecai did it when he learned of Haman's plot to destroy the Jews in Esther chapter 4 verse 1. You see, all of these situations bring home that sense of, of devastation, of loss, of just darkness that's happened. Showing how these people have fallen and the severity of their sin here. And then Caleb speaks. He gives the most amazing truths and encouragements to them. Look at what it says in verse 9. Look for yourself as I read it along. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not fear the people um, of the land. For they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them. And the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. This should have been an exhortation. Again, this should have been the moment when the Israelites realized and turned to trust in God. You see, he's done it so many times before them in the last few months when big mountains have been moved, when the impossible has been done. And yet as this truth is spoken, look what happens in verse 10. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones stoning them. This was an action that was reserved for apostates. People who, who rebelled against God. People who turned against God. We see it in Leviticus chapter two, 20 verse 2 if you want to have a look at that or verse 27 of the same chapter. How blinded these people are. How blind they've become. How far they've strayed off the path. You see, they're treating Moses, Aaron, Caleb, and Joshua as men who have gone against God when it's them who have gone against God. Those four men, those four leaders are trusting in God. And it is the congregation in front of them who are rebelling. Can I encourage you? Be careful here when we apply this to us. Don't make light of what's happened here. You see, these people have utterly turned their backs on God. They've taken their eyes off of him. They have accused God of not knowing what he's doing, of bringing them out of Egypt with a half-cooked plan, of bringing them out to die. How disrespectful is that of God, of the almighty God 
who's done so much for them, they're now doubting he's even capable of bringing through his promises. You see, God has made a promise and he will keep it in those days and in our days today. He will bring them to this promised land, but they have lost sight of that. They forgot all of his promises and doubted everything of God and who he is. They have moved so far from him that they long to be back in slavery. Christian, you have been brought out of slavery as well. Romans chapter 6 talks about being slaves once of sin. Yet there are times as we've been freed from sin, if we've trusted in Christ, there are times when we take our eyes off God. When we look to maybe our old lives or maybe to the lives of others who don't have God and seem to have so much wealth around them. Or maybe even when we just listen to the voice of temptation. As Satan comes and whispers in our ear, we take our eyes off God and we long to be in those places of slavery. Can I tell you that in those moments we are not seeing clearly? Do not run back to slavery. God is faithful. Life comes from Him. Didn't Jesus say, I've come that you may have life and in all of its abundance? He knows what's best. He knows what's right, what's joyous. Learn from what the Israelites don't do here and fix your eyes upon God again tonight. Maybe you'd like to pause this video now and and maybe make that resolve within you once again to say, Lord, I want to follow after you. I want to fix my eyes upon you again. I trust you. Well, thirdly and finally, We need saving. Now God shows his glory at the tent of meeting at this point. As the Israelites are are quarreling and grumbling and and as Moses and Aaron are on their faces in front of them and, and as Caleb and Joshua are ripping their clothes, you can just imagine the scene, can't you? Then the glory of God descends on the tent of meeting. But the thing is, is that God isn't just nipping in to see what's happening. God has been there all along. He's always been there and he always will be. He was listening, not just to the spokespeople, but he was also seeing every heart. And he was hearing every unspoken word within each of the people. God knew exactly what was happening. God knows exactly what's happening in our lives and in our hearts today. And just listen to his words. They're so cutting. Verses 11 and 12, follow it with me as well. How long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me despite of all the signs that I have done among them? I will strike strike them with pestilence and disinherit them and I will make you a nation greater and mightier than they. You see, this isn't the first time this has happened. Exodus 32, it happens. And uh, funnily enough, as I was preparing this, I was thinking, this is very familiar what I'm writing. And I realized I'd actually spoken on it in a prayer meeting earlier on in lockdown. If you want to find that, it's titled, Did Moses Change God's Mind? And you can contemplate that yourself. The Israelite grievance is with Moses and Aaron on the surface. But actually... It's far more with God, as we've been saying. Just look at God's words again. He's saying, how long will these people despise me? Not just distrust, not just kind of say, oh God, I'm not quite sure. How long will they despise me? You see, in their actions, they they speak so much of, of who they think God is. And then he goes on to say, how long will they not believe in me? In spite of all the signs I've done among them, the signs that we talked about before, and that's why we spend so much time talking about these huge mountains of impossibility that God moved to prove himself to the people, to show them that he is the one true God, and yet still 
they choose not to follow after God. Still their hearts are hard against him and they rebel against him. God says, I've provided the signs for them. How long will they continue not to believe in me? The mountains have been moved so many times and they still do not think that I can do this. Just as a bit of an extra thought, contrast that to what you would read in a, in a little while in Joshua when the two spies go in and they speak to Rahab. Rahab is actually in that promised land. She is in a city called Jericho and she hears that the spies are coming from the Israelites, from the Hebrew people. And, they, and she says to them, we've heard all that your God has done and we're afraid. You see, Rahab, even not being there, not seeing it, just hearing the reports, she has the right heart before God. But these Israelites who've been there, who've experienced it, who've seen it firsthand, still are just so hard against God. And so God decides to wipe them out. I think it's important here that we, we're just so clear This is a a truth that we should all pay close attention to. Sin is not overlooked by God. God is holy. He's perfect in every way. He is good. There is not a hint of wrong found in him. And he will not allow sin into his presence. For that reason, none of us not just the Israelites, not just the people of the Old Testament, but me and you today, because we're sinners, none of us can stand. None of us will be able to get past God's judgment. Sin is serious. And judgment will come to all of us. Jesus himself makes that so clear in his teachings. Heaven is real. Hell is also real to and just think about this for a moment Moses has been disrespected he's been discredited he's nearly been stoned they picked up stones to stone him they, they were so angry at him think of everything that he's just endured in the last few moments and by the way that's not the first time he was almost killed by the people he was meant to be leading they are a real pain to say the least No doubt Moses is is worn down by them. He's worn down by their disobedience and probably just worn down in general by their hard-heartedness and their short-sightedness. And God has said that the promises will be fulfilled through Moses. Did you see that when he spoke? He, He said, I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. You see, so Moses could have just said, well, hey, you know, I'm okay. (laughs) <laughs> these people, they've made their choice. They're, they've gone down that route, but, but I know that I'm going to be okay because God's made that promise to me. It's a blunt way of looking at things, isn't it? But it's just the truth here as well. However, look at the beginning of verse 13. It says this, but. You see, something within Moses calls him to intercede for these wretched people. And you can begin to read that from verse 13 onwards. Why? The people didn't deserve it. They didn't deserve anything. They certainly didn't deserve Moses pleading for their lives. See, Moses um, cannot ask God to forgive them because of anything that's found within them. Because there's nothing. But Moses is concerned with God's name and God's fame. Verses 15 and 16. Now if you kill this people as one man, then the nations who have heard of your fame will say, it is because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land that he swore to give them, that he has killed them in the wilderness. You see, in essence here, Moses is saying, Don't let other people think that you can't do this, God. Let everyone around know that you are God, the one true almighty God, by upholding these people, even though they don't deserve it. And Moses, unlike the Israelites, 
call upon God's promises. Look at the contrast between these two sets of people. The Israelites just saying it can't be done and grumbling and and choosing just the, the ludicrous path to Moses who goes right back to the promises of God. And he says this in verses 17 to 19. And now, please let the power of the Lord be great as you have promised, saying the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love Forgiving iniquity and transgressions, but he will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Moses continues, please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love. Just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. He's calling back the promise that God spoke himself in Exodus chapter 34 verse 6 where he says that he is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Moses recalls the promises. He fixes his eyes upon God. When the mountain is huge, he trusts in God all the more and he clings to the promises of God. And so look at what happens in verse 20. As he calls upon the Lord's steadfast love, God's wrath is turned away. Then the Lord, verse 20, said, I have pardoned according to your word. There's an interesting question there, isn't it? Did Moses change God's mind here as well? But notice this, that God raises Moses to intercede on behalf of the people. He uses Moses to relent the wrath that they deserved. There is so much more in this story and you'll see from the very next verse that they don't get off scot-free, that there is a price to pay. But here as the wrath is relented, we see that God has brought Moses forwards to save the people. Read it for yourself. It's fantastic. So how about us? Our sin is toxic in our lives. We cannot be accepted by God. We deserve the punishment sin is due and we have no defense. We're in a sorry state, each and every one of us. Like the Israelites, God cannot forgive us because of anything in us. There is nothing that we can bring before God. But God has raised an intercessor for us. This man is is, is far greater than Moses. This man was sinless. This man didn't come to turn God's wrath away for, for a temporary time. But for once and for all. This man was no ordinary man. He is God himself. His name is Jesus. And Jesus came to bear our sin upon himself. So that if we trust in him, we can be led from the slavery of sin that leads to death. And we can be led to the freedom of forgiveness that leads to everlasting life. You see, rather than relenting God's wrath, Jesus bore God's wrath. The wrath that that we deserve because of our sin, Jesus took it all. And he took it for me. And he took it for you. As I finish, let me just ask you very heartfelt and honest plea. If you haven't yet trusted in Jesus, trust in him tonight. Forgiveness and saving grace can be found in him. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge that is found within these pages. Lord, this is history. This is true events. And as we read them thousands of years later, Lord, you're just as active. You're just as powerful. And these words are just as true in our lives as well. Lord, help us not to push you out when the mountains seem too big. Help us to fully rely on you. Help us to fix our eyes upon you when other ways seem more appealing because we know, Lord, that there are lies that are being fed to us. Help us to trust in you 
and see your goodness. And Lord, for each and every one of us, let it be our story that we are saved by the living God. That through what Jesus has done for us upon the cross, thank you, Lord, for that. Lord, that we've trusted in you and that we are saved. Lord, for those of us who are Christians, let that be our battle cry. Let that be our song. Let that be our joy and our strength that we are saved and loved by the Almighty God. And for those of us, Lord, who have not yet trusted in you, right now, let this be the moment that we turn to you and say, Lord, please forgive me. I'm a sinner. I believe that you came and you died for me. And I want to follow after you. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. Well, as we finish tonight, we're going to sing Jesus Paid It All. Again, another amazing song of all that God has done for us. I hope that as you sing this, it will speak to your heart. And if you are a Christian, can I encourage you, wherever you are, um, even if you're watching this on the street or whatever else, just belt it out. It's a fantastic truth. God bless you and take care.